Okay, Nancy. Yot A. Shio. Hello, and welcome to the first presentation of our Indigenous Speaker Series focused on the Pacific Northwest. My name is Dr. Nancy Maryboy, and I'm the founding president and executive director of the Indigenous Education Institute. I am Dene Navajo and Cherokee, and have been working in the area of Indigenous education for many years. The Indigenous Education Institute, IEI, along with the San Juan Island National Historical Park and the Madrona Institute, is proud and honored to present a sense of place, indigenous perspectives of earth, water, and sky in the Pacific Northwest. Over the past three years, we have presented eight sessions of our original speaker series, featuring renowned indigenous speakers from around the United States and Canada. And now I'm honored and pleased to begin this new series focused on indigenous people and environments of the Pacific Northwest. I would like to begin today with a heartfelt acknowledgement of the indigenous peoples of our mother earth to honor our many participants from around the world. Usually we acknowledge the land on which we are living or presenting, but in this day and age of virtual online realities and the pandemic of COVID-19, we wish to honor all indigenous peoples around the world. I also want to acknowledge that I currently reside on the ancestral lands of the saltwater salmon people of the Salish Sea, who have called this place home since time immemorial. I honor the inherent and acquired treaty rights of these indigenous peoples. To lead off our Pacific Northwest series, we are most honored to bring you Larry Campbell, whose traditional name is Wanasea, to be our first speaker. Larry is from the Swinomis Nation in Washington State near the town of Laconner. He's a renowned elder and former Swinomis Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. When I say we, I mean the Indigenous Education Institute, or IEI, which is a nonprofit institution with an all Indigenous board and staff that has been in existence for over 25 years. We are located on the San Juan Islands in Washington State and on the Navajo Nation. Our mission is to preserve, protect, and apply traditional Indigenous ways of knowing to contemporary life with a focus on native education, environmental change, and sustainable healthy environments on the earth, the water, and in the skies. Much of our work concerns the creation of collaborations with integrity, a term that we have coined, between Western science and traditional indigenous ways of knowing. The presentations in this series have been chosen to reflect an awareness of the foundations of traditional indigenous thinking and living. In our native ways, everything is interconnected. So rather than a specific focus on biology, astronomy, or other separate disciplines, we will be presenting dynamic worlds of interrelationships and processes of reciprocity. Another focus for this speaker series is expanding awareness and understanding for cultural differences to support more successful and diverse working relationships, whether it be in education, national resource management, NASA, museums, and science centers or tribal communities. I want to thank you personally for attending this webinar. The interest you have shown is overwhelming. We have over 500 people registered from all across the United States. And we have participants from around the world, including Canada, from British Columbia to Newfoundland. It is also interesting and especially heartwarming for me that we have more than 90 tribes. Um, actually, we have more than 100 tribes represented in our registration for this presentation today. Most of our presentations for the Sense of Place Indigenous Perspectives on Earth and Sky presentations have been recorded 
and can be accessed at the Indigenous Education Institute website shortly following the events. Since you all have registered by email, we will also share notices to you for upcoming presentations. And now I want to turn the microphone over to Alexis Friedi, our superintendent of the San Juan National Historical Parks and a great ally for all Native people. Lexi. Thank you, Nancy, for all the work you and your extended team do to make this speaker series such a success. It is truly a joy to know and work with you and the Indigenous Education Inst Institute. Um, you are a wonderful mentor, friend, and advocate that I admire. As Nancy mentioned, I hold the title of Superintendent for San Juan Island National Historical Park. And coming here in 2016, it was, a very, it was very humbling to inherit the leadership responsibility for a park that seemed to very deliberately not include public interpretation about collaboration with, nor celebrating the richness of the indigenous people of the San Juan Islands. The parks enabling legislation reflecting the racist perspectives of the past does not mention a single word about the indigenous Coast Salish people who cared for these landscapes since time immemorial. About nine years ago, my predecessor, Lee Taylor, started to open the park's management direction to more dialogue and better working relationships with tribal communities. And our staff have made, a have made our intentions clear. We must establish different expectations of ourselves. And those expectations cannot be created in a westernized perspective vacuum. It must be informed by regular and direct feedback from tribal nations whose ancestral territories are those now stewarded by the National Park Service. Even though it appears that we're starting to tack in a better direction, there is a heaviness that comes with 150 years of colonial occupation of native lands. Ironically, the year 2022 is the 150th anniversary of the so-called boundary dispute resolution or the pig war between the British and the American militaries that laid claim to the San Juan Islands. And we're planning to tell a story of this place very differently than how the, than the National Park Service has previously had the courage to do. So when Nancy and our colleague, Marcia DeShadney from the BLM, San Juan Islands National Monument, invited me to collaborate on an indigenous led speaker series about four years ago, I was elated. This speaker series is an opportunity to support a new kind of educational programming. This idea for the speaker series was big and ahead of its time because Nancy wanted to reach the world with an online format. One of the very many reasons why she's so inspiring to work alongside. For too long, our park and the National Park Service more broadly has utterly failed to listen to indigenous perspectives and voices. We've excluded the original caretakers of lands we now manage from our decision-making and our public interpretation and educational programming has never adequately celebrated the richness and depth of native communities. Nor have we invited native communities collaboration to tell their stories from their perspectives. Now that we're two years deep into a global pandemic and in spite of the world feeling pretty zoomed out, we thank you for setting your time and focus aside for the speaker series. Having Larry Campbell here with us today is a testament of how well-respected Nancy and IEI are and why people place their trust in her instincts. This speaker series is a platform that does celebrate contemporary indigenous thought leaders, authors and writers, earth and sky advocates, knowledge holders, cultural bearers, and explorers. In a world that is so divided and toxic, this speaker series is a bright spot, a place we gather to learn, to feel, and to become inspired to carry forward the good work that you all are doing out there. It's time for Western culture, particularly that which drives local state federal governments and academic institutions to step aside and let our indigenous communities take the lead. 
there is a clear, strong voice that this forum is both critical and it's long overdue. San Juan Island National Historical Park is committed to providing support to the Northwest Speaker Series because we believe so deeply in its impact. We must listen to and incorporate indigenous perspectives to tell the true and ongoing history of this place and its meanings. This critical shift in understanding recognizes the important work that we do for native people and how we need to carry our work out differently and more intentionally than we have done in the past. Thank you, and I'll turn it back to Nancy. Thank you so much, Alexis, for your words. And you probably can now see and understand why we enjoy working with her and Joe, Joe and the Park Service. And we really appreciate your support. Thanks for mentioning Marcia de Chardonnay. She, was, she and I were the ones that spent about a year talking and dreaming about this. And it's... Um, She's over in another state now, so she just can't be with us, but um, thank you, Marsha. And thank you, Jamie Donatuto, for all you did. Jamie's a partner working with uh, Larry and Swinomish, and she, um, had, uh, she helped us with all the arrangements for this uh, talk. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce my dear friend and honored elder, Larry Campbell, Wanasea. And Larry, if I'm not saying your name right, please correct me um, when you talk. Uh, Larry has been actively involved in Coast Salish tribal affairs for 40 years. He has an extensive background in cultural resources, tribal policy, government to government relations, and community health. He has a Bachelor of Arts degree in tribal government. He co-manages the Swinomish Community Environmental Health Program. He is on the board of directors of Northwest Indian College, the only tribal college in the Pacific Northwest. His traditional name, Wanasea, was passed down to him from his ancestors. He has been a Swinomish employee for more than 35 years and a community member all his life. Much of his expertise comes from his traditional longhouse tribal elders, family, and many years of making a living on the water as a fisherman. Larry will tell you that his traditional education and his college degree go hand in hand in making him an effective tribal employee who is able to work with his own community members as well as non-Indigenous governments citizens and businesses on the proper manner and protocols with which to engage with the tribe. And so, Larry, I'm turning it over to you. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Nancy. Uh, thank you, Alexis. Uh, <clears throat> again, my name is Larry Campbell. My Indian name is Wanasia. And I'm a registered uh, a uh, member of the Sword Indian tribal community. Uh, if we could get that map. Uh, but, uh, okay, you see the area in green here, that's, that's our reservation. It's about 10 square miles or uh, 10,000 acres too, I believe. It used to be 50-50, it was a checkerboarded reservation, which there was a lot of non-Indians who lived there and who had private property there. Uh, but through some of the government programs that tribes received and our economic development, we've been buying back as much as that we can. So I think that we're at the stage where we own about 75% uh, of the land now. Uh, a lot of this is helping, uh, helping us uh, making it easier to govern. Uh, <clears throat> we are about 75 miles north of Seattle. Uh, when we're about 50 miles off of the I-5 corridor uh, from Mount Vernon, Washington. And, uh, and we got Anacortes to the west of us. Uh, and uh, when you look at this map, you'll see that uh, approximately 95% of our borders is on is designated by water. 
uh, you have this one this channel, which is on the east side of our reservation, which divides us in the town of O'Connor. You got Skagit Bay and uh, up at the north and out just off the Smilk Bay there. Uh, uh, that is one of the places where uh, uh, we have the land border to that with, you know, the border with Skagit County. So <clears throat> uh, I don't know what the, uh, populations are now, but we have about a thousand tribal members and uh, we have uh, uh, and there's also about uh, 2,500, maybe 3,000 non-Indians that live on the reservation. So <clears throat> over the time, as our land become checkerboarded, it made it harder to make decisions uh, on environmental protection uh, and planning. So <clears throat> as we start, um, as we start dwelling on these questions and trying to figure out what we're going to do, uh, uh, we come up with, with a process. Uh, in 1990 or 91, Washington State Police passed the Growth Management Act. The Growth Management Act basically says that all, uh, all counties, municipalities, uh, over a certain population need to uh, <clears throat> do uh, uh, a planning exercise in developing uh, uh, codes and policies and uh, ordinances for uh, uh, for the next 20 years. And when we saw that uh, uh, Skagit County was doing that, we went under a simple, similar program. We start, uh, we did, redid our comprehensive plan that was 20, 25 years old. Uh, and then we start looking at our zoning in the reservation. And we looked at what Skagit County did. And then we finally decided to, uh, uh, as we start comparing them towards the end of this process, and we realized that uh, a lot of the stuff that could be an arguing point between us and the county uh, was taken care of by the similarities of our uh, of our zoning designations. So, uh, <clears throat> and again, that, and then we set up a dual permit process to where uh, if it's a tribal, tribal permit, then it goes through the tribal processes only. But if it's non Indian or in too simple land, then we, uh, we got uh, uh, both jurisdictions involved. Uh, say like someone will apply for a billing permit uh, and they'll go through Skagit County and when they get through Skagit County process, they'll send it over to tribe and we will review it and uh, uh, and then to see if we agree with Skagit County's uh, uh, conditions they put on the permit. And so it, this is one of the reasons why uh, our chairman said at one time, we're known as one of the most progressive tribes, you know, uh, in the nation, uh, mainly because, but we are also a very traditional tribe also. Uh, uh, Chris, you can kill the map, I guess. Oh, hi, Nancy. <laughs> uh, and <clears throat> so, So when that happened, so again, like I said, we had a dual permit process and the dual permit process allowed us to both look at it. And if there's difference of opinion, we attempted to work it out through the staff level. And uh, saying in Washington State there was, uh, uh, when we have issues with the tribe, the state would say that we're attempting to solve those through cooperation rather than litigation, or negotiation rather than litigation. And that's one of the basic tenets of our people. We like to be good neighbors. Uh, we have about 20 tribes here on the western side of uh, the state of Washington from the Cascades to the west there. And uh, we're all smaller tribes, but at the same time, uh, we're close together. So here at Swedish, 
we have another four or five types within a, about a 40 to 50 mile hour radius. So, and uh, we have a lot of relations over there. The Coast Salish extends all the way up to Vancouver Island. Uh, and, you know, they consider uh, the Canadian tribes, even though we don't work with them politically too much, uh, that uh, they consider the San Juans their, what they call their youth and custom areas. One criticism of our planning process was <clears throat> uh, if we're going to let the county decide what's happening in any country, we're giving away our sovereignty. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we look at it and say this, the county was an immovable object. And so we had to figure out some way to where we could get, uh, uh, we could find a way to cooperate. So we did that and it's been a process been going on for about 25 years. And from that point on, it just become a bureaucratic exercise as we start developing a professional planning department, uh, environmental protection, you know, and that covers uh, water, land, earth, uh, uh, and air. So, uh, we have all the resources here in our tribe that uh, we have probably a thousand employees, uh, 350 work with government itself and rested at our economic development uh, strategy. So, but again, as we look at, uh, as we looked at uh, how do we, how did we do this stuff? And we had a hard time getting tribal members to get involved in planning because it's such a Western and a linear process that people really didn't feel comfortable with it. And so uh, but that was one of my first jobs when I worked with the tribe. I, was, I had to go out to all the planning conferences and as much as I could to give uh, presentations on behalf of our tribe. Uh, to let them know uh, who we are, what we're about, how we like to do things. Uh, so that's uh, really important to be able to uh, kind of get that cooperation. When I was 17, our elders, uh, the elders told us that your generation, we want you to go to college and, and get in a Western education, but we don't want you to become white people. We want you to remain tribal, but by, how did they say it? Learning how the enemy works, then we can find out better ways on how, how we can work together. And so that's what Swinomish is doing. And after 15 years, uh, uh, all those tribes that uh, criticize us for giving away our sovereignty, uh, come back and ask us, how'd you do that? <laughs> And let me tell you, it was a long process that uh, kind of started back in the mid-60s, and uh, it, it, it takes a long time to get anything done in a uh, tribal country. Uh, <clears throat> one of the reasons uh, my main criticism of our tribe is was that all of our different offices and our different programs didn't communicate with each other, and I thought that this is something that we need to do so that we can coordinate our strategies to find healing on the reservation. Um, I would say that on the Swimming Reservation, all the dysfunctions in society that are out in the non indian world are out here at Swimming too, but they're, uh, they're magnified just because of who we are. Uh, we were pre predisposed to alcoholism, drugs, uh, bad health. Uh, so, <clears throat> again, that uh, we start looking at it to, again, how can we have a strong voice and determine our own future? And when we look back at the 90s, we had uh, a lot of federal laws that come in. Uh, called self-determination, uh, self-government. Uh, and these were laws that helped us 
uh, in, under self-government, we say that uh, we can manage our grants. Let us manage our grants uh, and let us, you know, kind of design them in the way that we know is beneficial for our people. And the problem that we had, we we've had over the years is that we'd start a project with the grant money, and but then when the grant money run out, whatever work we did had to stop too. It had to stop, and so we are just starting to get uh, get successful and starting to get a handle on things, and then uh, the money would run out and then we would uh, have to go look for some more money. But sometimes it, it enables, it, it made it difficult for us to be able to put things in a straight line to make, you know, the progress that we made, make it, uh, you know, one, one step after the other without skipping any steps. So <clears throat> by, and at the time there, I think when we go back and we still get, Day that uh, the people we hire sometimes they don't look good on paper, but uh, we see something in them that uh, would uh, know that they'd be great employees for the tribe. Uh, so, and we always say in Swedish, our famous saying here is that if there's a way around it, we'll find it. So, and this is what happened to planning too. When I was in planning, working in a planning department, then staff would come and say that, "Hey, we got this opportunity to do this, this, and that." And I said, "Well, we should actually we should be doing this, that, and this. Uh, why aren't we?" He said, "Well, it's not in the grant requirements. There, and therein lies one of our major problems." as a tribal government that, uh, uh, and what the idea is when you go back to the 60s to the, to the 80s, mid 80s, that uh, we're only able to keep, you know, key staff people for a couple of years and then they went on. We are the first step on the career ladder and then they would be gone. So <clears throat> uh, this is a saying I got from our chairman that it takes, it takes us two years to retrain our staff uh, to think like Swinomish. Uh, and with PhDs, it takes longer. So we do have an education program here. Uh, and this is one thing that I do is I take people out in cultural orientations and I just give them a sense of all our responsibilities. I give them a sense of how we like to do things and just remind them that uh, sometimes we'll make a decision not to do this, but to do it in that way. And uh, <laughs> it makes sense to us, but you know, non Indian people would look at it and uh, be mystified. In fact, that uh, we did have to hire so many non Indians because uh, we didn't have the education level in our own community to, uh, <clears throat> to fill those positions. So that's one of the things that we're starting to, to do in Swinomish. Nancy mentioned that I serve on the board of Northwest Indian College and Northwest Indian College, uh, the main campus is based in Lummi, the Lummi Reservation north of us. And they, uh, they started up uh, uh, and, and started up and built this North, Northwest Indian College. And, uh, initially it kind of started out as a technical college training people to work in their aquaculture programs. One of the Lummi leaders ended up back in the old days on uh, John D. Carson show, uh, Sam Kagi, he was uh, the elder there. And he says, instead of doing what the government wants us to do, we want to do something that we know about, you know, and that is fish, clams, the crabs. Uh, all of these things that we can consider our tr traditional food. Uh, we're up, up here in the Northwest. Uh, we are extremely fortunate. I think that uh, we are probably always one of the wealthiest tribes. 
even though we were small, mainly because that uh, we had so much resources here. And your resources are your economic system uh, for us to struggle people because again, that we, uh, uh, that we live close to the land. Our illness used to tell us that during the depression in the 30s that uh, uh, we didn't, he said Indian life didn't change very much. It was just the non-Indians who did, who lived under the, you know, the capitalistic society. And when it, that was under stress, there was no job for them to have. But we still continued to go out and hunt and fish and gather stuff from the natural world and uh, began to actually continue to live the way that we, we'd lived from time immemorial here. So <clears throat> uh, any fisherman that you talk to, they ask why would you want to become a fisherman? We say, because it's in our blood. <laughs> mm. I put about 20 years into it and uh, I fished with a, a good friend of mine who taught me in, ins and outs on it. And then later on, went and got my own boat. And I decided at 40 to go back to college. And so that was the hardest thing I ever had to do in a long time uh, was to put my boat away to go back to college. And uh, what I did that then, I didn't know why I become a fisherman, really, you know, I didn't think much of it about it, but then I realized that later on in this uh, job that I have now with our tribe, uh, we need to be able to uh, describe oh, really what does fishing mean to us. When you look at the dysfunctions on the reservation, you'll see that he has another project working on the 13 millions is that our our calendar year was uh, kind of determined by uh, uh, the seasons in which we gathered stuff. So we ended up with 13 months instead of 12 uh, so that we could divide up uh, uh, is when we gathered, you know, certain stuff, when the fish start coming up the river and we have the five species of salmon that all come back to our river. And we live right at the mouth of the Skagit River. So uh, it is pretty, uh, we're, we're pretty rich here. Uh, my father's side of people were upper Skagit. So they lived up, up, up river for about, uh, uh, they lived, they lived up river. So, uh, and that was all freshwater. Uh, I learned the freshwater rules there uh, as a child growing up in, uh, in the upper Skagit territory. And then about 17, mom and I moved to Swinomish and then I had to learn salt water, which is completely different. Uh, I was saying uh, with, uh, with freshwater, it only flows in one direction. <clears throat> It only flows in one direction, but when I got the swimish, the tide does a lot of crazy things. <laughs> uh, and sometimes uh, our, our fishermen who spent so much time on the water, they can really, uh, uh, it's almost like the intuition or, you know, their senses are really uh, magnified and they're able to sense what the tide is doing and where to be. So in 1974, we had the bold decision. Uh, then we had, <clears throat> we and the federal government sued the state of Washington and asked them to uh, define or uh, clear up through the court uh, what does use and custom area mean, uh, and how do we retain that ability to hunt and fish in our use and custom areas, which means is that our reservation we have. Uh, our tribe has about five counties, uh, three complete counties and two uh, north and south ends of them uh, that kind of go into our area. So uh, again, it, so what he said is that uh, uh, what that meant was that uh, tribes have the ability to get 
50% of the harmful salmon. And then further work down the line that the tribes would manage their 50% and then the state would manage their 50%. Uh, and as we go forward, we call it co-management. So <clears throat> over, over time, over time, our uh, our tribe, we really had to learn to work with the, you know, the county, the uh, 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 the state, and 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 the municipalities. We had to learn how to work with them and uh, get acquainted with them. Every time that we run into a conflict with a resident on the reservation, a non-Indian, that they all come up with some wild ideas because even though we live right next to them, uh, they don't know anything about us. And that is, uh, and that in the past has been one of the stumbling blocks to uh, effective government uh, from a tribal side and a non-tribal side is, <clears throat> you know, we, get, we, we have to get to know each other. Uh, <clears throat> So when I saw this, going back to the 90s, when I, when I saw this, uh, I started giving cultural person, cultural and historical, political uh, uh, lectures to anyone who requested them. A lot of nonprofits, uh, colleges, universities, uh, just anyone who we asked, uh, local schools. Um, and I remember when I first started working for a tribe in the 90s, uh, every anthropologist and archaeologist I met would always say, oh, we want to work with you so bad that we want, we want you to teach us how to tell the story. And we tell them, we want to tell our own story. <laughs> You've told us <laughs> our story for long enough. Now we have to set the record straight. And so that's what we began to do is to uh, is to be able to uh, take these relationships and 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 build on them, and so now uh, we get along fairly well with the you know the county uh, that we're in, and after a while that uh, it just become you know like a bureaucratic exercise, and. But again, that uh, our whole tribe, when all these different laws and ordinances from the federal level come uh, come forward, then we had to, we had to have uh, we had to learn how to negotiate, how to tell our story, and how to let it uh, uh, how to let people know why it's important to us and why we make decisions of the way that we do. Uh, so it's not a mystery anymore. Uh, and my part of it is, because uh, I belong to uh, our traditional uh, spiritual communities, uh, what we call our longhouse uh, section, it's our traditional religion that we've been practicing since time immemorial. And we have a lot of, uh, you know, oral history and oral uh and traditional laws there that we still have to follow. And therein lies the trouble with some of, some of the tribes that, is that as we begin to uh, make progress and accept money in the form of grants uh, from the United States uh, and them telling us how to use it and to spend it, uh, uh, again, as time went by, we were able to uh, develop these programs for ourselves uh, with the needs that we saw uh, in our community. Uh, health, education, welfare, that's one of the things that uh, the, the treaty that we signed the federal government promised us. Uh, so Northwest Indian College serves a part of that process of education. Uh, it started out as a technical school, built up to community college, then a four-year four uh, uh, bachelor's degree program, so about five of them. And I think we're even starting to offer a, a master's too. So with the Lummi elders who uh, 
who founded the school and got it started, they said that uh, just because the college was there didn't mean anyone would walk to the door. And they said that we had to figure out how do we how do we get our own people to come through the door? And, and they said, well, culture. So they start offering culture type classes that uh, culture and history that was uh, really focused on the tribal side of it rather than the non-tribal side of it. And that really caught the people's ear, you know, and, and their interest and they start getting involved into it. Even though when I was in college, uh, uh, one of the professors I worked with uh, uh, said that, you know, if you look at a certain law, you take the Indian Reorganization Act, uh, for instance. What was that? Uh, uh, what was that? Uh, meant to accomplish? And what was happening in the United States at the time that kind of allowed that uh, law to be, you know, to come into being? and how it was administered. So uh, for my research, they say that uh, a lot of our elders used to say here that they were hesitant to take the money in form of grants because he says pretty soon, we'll, we won't be able to do anything without money. <laughs> he said before they just, you know, decided what needed to be done and figured out how to do it. And they did it, uh, didn't ask didn't ask questions or permission. Uh, I always say that a lot of our land that was in UNA uh, become private property, become government land. And what and then the no trespassing signs went up. And sometimes we'd have to go into these areas to be able to uh, gather the stuff that we needed for our ceremonies or our foods and our medicines. So this is one of the things that we're doing here in Swinomish. We're, <clears throat> we're <clears throat> wanting to uh, expose our tribal community to uh, the plants and the foods and the medicines. Uh, uh, you know, how, how do you, uh, how do you uh, gather them? You know, how do you cook them? You know, how do, how do you do... Uh, how do you feed your family with it? And even though uh, we had people who specialize in uh, the plant, the healing qualities of plants, that uh, uh, it made it an, uh, an important resource for us. But then when we got restricted to the reservation, we, uh, we, lost, uh, we lost access to that. So then, it seems like we quit teaching it too. So, so now we're starting to get access to these things. And so now we're trying to bring these programs back. And one of the things Jamie and I are doing with the Indigenous Health Indicators is that uh, what we saw at the university level is that there was uh, a complete, almost a complete absence of tribal members in hard science and research programs at the university. And after a while, we talking over a lot of people, we found out that uh, we stayed away from it because we didn't like the way it was being taught. And uh, so, uh, so again, that Northwest Indian College is offer us an opportunity to go back uh, and to get these teachings and uh, revitalize uh, that knowledge and so we can uh, so we can share that with the people uh, and one of the good things about that is that uh, we want our people to be able to uh, take us up and be proud of who they are as swimming people which means that you have to find pride. A lot of us when we grew up in, you know, in my day that we were, we were desperately poor. We we struggled into life. All the dysfunctions were in our community, uh, but we survived. 
we're resilient. One to catch words of today, we're resilient. But <clears throat> that enable us to, uh, again, as we begin to say, hey, our ancestors were pretty sophisticated uh, with no education, but they were educated in the Indian way. So <clears throat> we want to bring a lot of this back so it becomes an integral part of the decision making, uh, especially with our government today, that uh, they always need to be able to, uh, as they're making a decision, whether to pursue a grant or a project, uh, to uh, actually consider, okay, what are our traditional, what, are, what areas may be sacred? Uh, so that's one of the things I did for over 10 years. Uh, I was a tribal historic preservation officer. So uh, I protected uh, the, the archeological sites in our use and custom area here. And uh, uh, it become quite a, quite a uh, complex work because in a lot of our areas here, sometimes we have six tribes who have an interest in one area. And we are like, uh, uh, I guess the tribes in, uh, when they go back into history, some tribes got along and were allies and some were enemies. So, uh, it, but it encourages us to be able to, uh, to begin to work together. And uh, before a lot of people used to throw a pot of money on the floor and watch us fight over it. Uh, 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 and then, at the end, uh, the non-Indian governments would get what they wanted in the first place. Uh, we're become quite uh, politically sophisticated too, and uh, we have two organizations that help us work on that as a, a regional and as a national level. And that's affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians and uh, the National Congress of American Indians. And, that is an opportunity, you know, for a lot of our staff people uh, to go to these conferences and see what the other tribes are doing, how they're doing it, how they made their decision. Uh, and again, that uh, uh, it's not a big secret out there, but uh, this is how tribes help each other to be able to share our successes. And just as important, sharing our failures and what not to do in any situation. One thing uh, we all learn that uh, our people are like the five tribes, five or six tribes that are close by here. We have relations in all of those you know, <laughs> uh, communities. I always say for myself, and on Swinomish and Kiki Ellis, on Samish, on Tsunamit's First Nation and Vancouver Island, uh, Saanich, uh, and Port Welsh. And I call it the Heinz 57 Indian country. And that's about basically who we are, you know, is that we, uh, uh, we have ties in a lot of the different programs. And we use that as part of our, uh, our economic strategy also because Back in the day, they had arranged marriages, and a lot of those main arranged marriages really dealt with uh, the, the fact that they would uh, uh, they would have access to resources there. So if we knew that there wasn't going to be coho salmon in Skagit this year, uh, what are we going to do for coho? And we say, oh well, well we start going to have a lot of coho this year. Let's uh, let's go visit our daughter during coho season. And they said that if you ask in the right way, that uh, permission was hardly ever uh, not granted. But that's how we look for, took care of each other. We say everything in our 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 life here, in our traditional life, our spiritual life, uh, is reciprocal. I guess the, the other thing that happens here, if I have a cousin who comes over and says, can I borrow $20, I'll pay you on Friday. <laughs> well, Friday comes and I don't see my $20, but 
uh, I understand that it will come down the road sometime down the road, maybe when I need it or when there's something going to my family uh, that I need. So uh, we don't forget those debts, even though we don't pay them on Friday like promised. <clears throat> But just taking care of each other, and I think that was predominant among uh, people who depend on the natural world, you know, for their for their wealth. Uh, and like I said, we're wealthy people here because uh, we had, you know, uh, so many salmon that come into our river, and we didn't have to go a long ways to, to find them. They were just uh, three quarters of a mile. <laughs> uh, uh, to the west, so. so we were fortunate that we heard of some of the tribes that live in desert conditions had to move every three or four days so they didn't wipe out uh, all the resources in one area. And <clears throat> I guess what you have to understand, why are the tribes so dedicated to, to their place there were, were the tribes. And one of this that uh, uh, what determines on who we are and how we govern ourselves, it depends on the environment. It depends on the land, the water, uh, and, and, and the air. It depends on all these and how do, how do we take care of those, what traditional laws that we have, uh, how many fish should we catch? Uh, how many should we uh, let escape, you know, up the river to spawn? So <clears throat> it's like, uh, like I said earlier, if we end up going to Lummi and fishing with them. We had to fish with Lummi rules, you know, uh, because that they were the people that were in that area for so long that they had, they knew all the funding points and how, how to gather resources uh, that they needed. So again, that you see in our ceremonies that uh, are when we have death in our community, uh, there's always kind of a ceremonial cost with these and uh, and we help each other out. Uh, we take care of each other. Uh, like our elders would tell us that, hey, uh, if this family over here, uh, if they're in trouble or if they have something going on, uh, a ceremony or a death or something like that. You go help them because uh, then they explain how we're related. Uh, uh, the grandmothers for sisters go back 14, 40 generations go back. So. Mm -hmm. And it's when we share a thousand tribal members or elders just tell us that if we could talk long enough, we could be, we could be able to find out how every one of us are related to one another. Uh, this Indian name that I introduced myself by is, uh, it's not a name that translates anything, it's just a family name in the, in the language uh, itself. So, uh, but what it has is, uh, you know, the dignity and the strength and the, uh, the respect that those who carry these names put onto it. Yeah. So, <clears throat> uh, uh, and there's a special ceremony for that. And I think that uh, we we do our, we when fishing is over, then we go to our longhouses when the weather gets cold to carry out our traditions. Uh, one of the ones that we still do is uh, in the receiving of Indian names, people would, uh, <clears throat> gather their family up and they would find which names that were they were entitled to and th then they had a gathering to say validate it or to let the people know uh, what they will be known by. Uh, most of the people here in Swimmers call me want to see I don't hear Larry too often unless it's non union staff. Uh, but I've become known uh, by that name, so. Uh, and the other one is we have memorials when we lose somebody in our family. Uh, we are uh, entitled 
uh, from four years on to be able to put put on a memorial uh, uh, gathering for our loved ones. And the reason of that is that uh, uh, we, at some point in time that we have to let our grief and our sorrow go, we have to let it go. Uh, uh, and the memorial is the one way you can do that. We always say that uh, this is the last time you can cry for your loved ones. Huh? When you think of them now in the future, that you just think of uh, the happy times. So that's when I begin to realize that our our, our ceremonies and the way we do a lot of things was kind of dedicated to healing, healing within our tribal community. Uh, when we go to uh, these spiritual gatherings in the wintertime, we also call it our winter ceremonies. Uh, kind of starts when the fish drop quit running and uh, then they stop when the fish started in again in the spring. So again, we... Uh, uh, always, when people come to our gatherings, they always, the elders especially, are always looking for, you know, uh, salmon. That's usually the centerpiece of our uh, of our meal when we feed a lot of people. Uh, I worked as a table manager for a lot of years, uh, making sure when we had gatherings that people got uh, fed. They got fed in a proper order and we took care of any of their needs and uh, invariably they asked, who's cooking the fish? <laughs> uh, mainly because that we had some cooks that who really knew how to cook fish and, uh, and it goes on. Uh, in the old days, for, if we had a definite community that uh, if that happened, then our fishermen went out and got fish, our hunters went out and got deer or elk, our uh, clam diggers went out and got clams, uh, they went out and got crab, and all these different things that we consider our traditional foods uh, uh, to put in there. Uh, well, let me give you an example. This is a story that I tell quite often uh, when Jamie and I do the Indigenous Health Indicators uh, presentation. Um, but one day, me and my friend were driving around um, on the reservation, and his grandmother poked her head out the door and says, Grandson, it's time to go get mussels. He said, Okay, Grandma. So we took her right out to Whidbey Island uh, where the mussels were, we peeled them off the rock, uh, uh, and we took them home. And he he got down to the beach and he gathered, uh, you know, uh, uh, a number of uh, round rocks and he built a fire. He set, set the rocks down and then he built a fire uh, uh, <clears throat> over top of the rocks. And then when the rocks got hot, uh, they would move the fire. They would put the mussels on, on the on the hot rocks and then cover it with seaweed or a, a potato sack, uh, a 50 pound potato sack. And so when we, uh, when that was ready, uh, you only do it about 20 minutes, half an hour, and then it's, it's ready, then we let the people in the village know, uh, that, hey, we got mussels at Lonchi, you know, uh, come on down if you're, uh, if you're hungry. And so a lot of people come down you know, for taking to it. And of course, uh, my my friend's mother was sitting there eating really fast one day. Uh, and she was sitting there eating really fast. And then I see her, uh, her hand would dart in her old purse. And I see her grab a pill and she'd pop the pill. And 20 minutes later, she'd be popping another pill. And, I asked my friend, why did, why does your uh, your mom eat so fast? He said, I don't know, go ask her. So I went and asked her. And she said, I'm eating fast because I'm allergic to mussels. They're poison to me. I said, I'm going to get sick here pretty soon. That's why I'm chewing on Benadryl. 
I said, if it's going to make you sick, why are you eating it? And she said, why? Because my spirit demands it. So uh, it comes out to the question, I think, that goes, uh, you know, like this, is that what do we do when uh, certain foods are necessary for the spirit, but poisonous to the body? And what that really means is that we could put a health warning on certain foods uh, and so are several members not to eat it, but they may go ahead and do it anyway because they get to, it's like what we say, fish hungry, clam hungry. I tell our duck hunters that if there's an elder at eight o'clock in the morning wishing for ducks and you go out and get a bunch of ducks and you put them on a string and you leave them on the doorknob of that elder's house and you know that you really have the gift of being a great hunter because that uh, you're able to hear in your mind uh, that that elder was uh, wishing for some of his traditional food uh, to be able to sustain him to, you know, to find healing and to feed that spirit. You know, if we can keep the spirit strong, our body will be strong. So uh, <clears throat> as we go forward then, uh, that's why we say that uh, those of us who are dedicated to uh, our, our place to live, like a Germany say, we're a place-based people, that we spend some time in memorial here, uh, learning how to live in this place, learning what the limits are, and how much that we can gather, and how much we can, and our old people didn't like to waste anything. So, but again, it's coming from just knowing your land. And when you know your land, you have uh, a dedication to it. Uh, I see now the federal government starting with uh, George Bush and uh, uh, Cheney, <laughs> they're saying, why did the United States lose the war in Afghanistan? He said, well, tribalism. <laughs> uh, and I was just reading it here today too, that uh, they don't, you know, the people over in the Far East or Middle East are, are fighting by different rules. You know, they're fighting a guerrilla type instead of uh, a battle type uh, war that's going on. And, I think they, they forgot that's what they did to the English <laughs> in the War of Independence, that uh, uh, they hid behind the trees and shot and they did ambush. Uh, or they'd run into the, run into the woods and then uh, get them later, so. But again, that we understand that if we intend to stay here, for our wives and raise our children and grand great grandchildren here, that uh, we got to take care of our homeland. We got to still remember, you know, to, not to take too much, to use what uh, we do take and take care of. Uh, we, uh, our elders say a good hunter is not someone who can just say kill a deer, but who also takes care of it in a proper way when they get at home from the mountains. So, Again, these are some of the, the rules uh, that, that we have that work inside of our community that, uh, and that are taught to our young people. Uh, we have a lot of our people here have such a natural propensity for, for fishing. Uh, one of the others, he says, yeah, with our young people, he says, yeah. Uh, you get him a book, you get him a net, uh, you. Uh, and then they learn, they learn it on their own. You, know, but you just help them get started. Uh, there's another saying that goes around here that if you give a person a fish, you feed him for one day. But if you teach them how to fish, you'll feed them for the rest of their lives. 
So again, this is uh, again how do we learn uh, to catch the fish, and how do we learn how to uh, uh, to learn our patterns so that we we can be successful when we when we go after them. And I always say that there's always preparation uh, to get ready to go fishing, to work on your boat, to work on your nets. Um, there's the same way with uh, ceremony that uh, when we do when we do ceremony, there's a lot to prepare for, and our big families have a real advantage here because that. Uh, they can divide up all the responsibilities a lot of different ways to be able to make it uh, come over, uh, be a successful event. That's when I realized that, uh, uh, that's when I realized that in any ceremony, the process of getting to ceremony was just as important as the ceremony itself. <clears throat> but again, and that comes down to us through time. That comes down to us through the land and to the air and to uh, I think so. I remember our first our, our chairman. He's out of office now, but he was our chairman for about twenty five years. And when he got elected chair for the first time, uh, at a local newspaper in a. Uh, interviewed him and I said, okay, well, what changes are you gonna make in tribal government? And he said, not gonna make any. He says, our elders set out this path for us, uh, showed us what it was and how to do it. And uh, we're just going to keep going down that, that same path. Uh, we already have our instructions. So, you know, change wasn't necessarily uh, a good thing. And as a traditional people, we have a hard time dealing with change. Um, but again, uh, I guess living your life as a tribal member, it can be uh, it can be threatening, it can be uh, daunting. But then again, how do we uh, participate in a capitalistic society? Uh, also, you know, because. There's so many times that our cultures are complete opposition to each other, and but how 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 can we do the progressive thing without violating our traditional laws? Uh, and so that goes on. That work goes on. It it makes things really complicated uh, in in Indian country. So we want to be economically successful, but at the same time we want to do it in a way that is representative of our culture, our oral law, uh, and our oral history. So uh, again, that is what kind of makes us successful. Like I say, we have some tribes that uh, uh, when I worked in, when I was a tribal historic preservation officer, I worked with a lot of archeologists. Some tribes worked with their archeologists <laughs> to fight uh, the developer, whether it's the county or the town or private citizen. Uh, they, uh, so they, uh, that was, uh, trying to figure out how to say this. Uh, I'm getting aged now to where uh, I forget words and words I use every day. <laughs> Remember when my mom went through that and I finished her sentences. But, but again, that uh, we're trying to blend two things that usually don't belong in the same discussion. Uh, and it's good, it's challenging work. Uh, we're at the stage now, our tribes, our programs are starting to uh, get really successful. Um, like I said, that uh, drugs and alcohol are one of the major problems in our reservation. But uh, we have we just started an education department uh, 
uh, three people who are dedicated to uh, education and our tribal tribal membership. Uh, and, and plus that we can they can go to a tribal college if they just say go that way. But we're getting more and more of our young people who are going into places like the University of Washington, Arizona, Arizona State, Oklahoma. Uh, uh, and myself, I went to Western, which is in Bellingham, uh, and Skyes Valley College, which is Mount Vernon. So uh, <clears throat> we're starting to, and the big difference between uh, when our people go out and get the education like that, most all of them want to return home so they can improve the conditions here on the reservation. Uh, so yeah, they all come home and, and that's because of our dedication to our land and to our families. Uh, uh, that's why so many of us here, men in Skagit County couldn't get jobs because they, all the employers in Skagit County knew that as soon as uh, <laughs> uh, uh, as soon as fishing season started, we are gone. <laughs> uh, yeah, or that uh, the other thing is that um, maybe once a week or so we'd have, oh, when my cousin's passed, I got to go to a funeral. And, uh, so we had too big of families for employers, and so they didn't like to hire us because they know we we're under, undependable. Uh, so, so this is a challenge that we have in front of us today. Uh, again, uh, it feels like our programs are just now starting to uh, get to the stage of where it's going to be, you know, like a glorious uh, uh, time in our lives. It's like, you know, that book put out quite a while ago called The Tipping Point that we started all this work 50 years ago and it's kind of almost hit the peak now. And then after that, uh, it, it should all come together in a way that we, we should have it all worked out and how we need to make sure that we're, we're still uh, uh, a successful tribe. Uh, we can take care of our old people. Uh, many of our tribal members who fish, and that's preferred way of making a living here, uh, when they, uh, but a lot of them also work for the tribe itself, but they're allowed to take time out to go fishing, uh, personal time, uh, to go out and go fishing because they know someone who's been on the water is a lot happier employee than they are if they don't get to go fishing. Like I said, that when I put my boat away to go back to college, I couldn't go down the docks for a couple of years because everyone was telling their fishing stories and uh, I didn't have any to tell and made me miss the water more and more. So again, but life goes on and uh, after all these years of oppression, um, that uh, we we are starting to make progress, and as we begin to make process of progress, that we know that uh, it's not going to be just by ourselves doing this. That we're going to have, uh, hopefully, we'll have partners out there who will be able to work with us. Uh, when I talk to non union audience here in Skagit County, I, I would always encourage the young people or the parents of the young people to say that uh, say that uh, when uh, when go go anywhere to get an education but come back home you know come back to your home and that's just when you guys got six or seven generations that can uh, that were born and bred here in Skagit County then we'll I think that we'll get more alike with each other and then be able to make a uh, uh, decision on a cooperative level and on an adversarial level. So uh, again, that's uh, that's all part of who we are. And when I first started working with Jamie, um, uh, 
uh, she asked me if I wanted to work with her full time. And um, I was looking to get out of the cultural resources because uh, there was some spiritual work in there that was very stressful, I guess. And I needed to get out because it all had to do with our ancestors. And um, what <clears throat> I told Jamie, I said, well, uh, Here's what I think of science. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it, and I told her, and I said, here's what, and when I was going through all my likes and dislikes and, and told her that if, any, if I'm gonna work with you, any work we do, it's gotta go back in to lift up our, our community. And she says, I agree with you. I said, oh, good, then we can work together. And that's when I start working with her that, she was able to get the grants, uh, get them in a, you know, uh, in a linear uh, process that uh, allowed us to put, uh, you know, uh, the money that we received from the grants in a good positive way that uh, took us a while, but then again, it begins to really, uh, 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 really assert itself over time with our committee members. So we started out doing like a hundred interviews with tribal members to gather oral history. Uh, I think we went down and did some lower one or did some, uh, uh, had a smaller group who did that. And then we got a group of about 20 uh, and we went deeper into it. And uh, they tried a few ideas out on them and just, they see as something that they would uh, uh, they would support. So, uh, and again, as we start our plants and medicines and foods uh, uh, programs with thirteen moons, that it's uh, it's beneficial for tribal community. And again, uh, uh, the our tribal community just loves uh, learning. Uh, what our people knew for uh, what we knew in the time past. So again, uh, uh, as we go forward here, this is still a work in progress. It'll never be uh, work that'll be done as it will still be uh, trying to figure this out. And our earth is really under stress right now. Uh, and maybe we passed a tipping point. Uh, I really don't know, but then that was one of the reasons why uh, we were determined to work on climate change and sea level rise. And uh, because 90%, 95% of our borders is, is comes from the water. So that's a big and important, important thing for us. But then we begin to see the, the storms have changed, uh, the water's getting warmer. Uh, and because the water's getting warmer and the fish are real sensitive to that. And uh, the fishing runs are almost non-existent now. Uh, but we're still able to make uh, a living on um, crab, and, uh, crab and bottom fish. So we learn how to be able to uh, use our culture in a way that sustains us, in the way uh, it sustains us and uh, keeps us going. And so we know where that's our strength, you know. Uh, we would hope that uh, as time goes by that we could work with the scientists and how we say that uh, uh, where the tribes get left out in the scientific research is uh, uh, is the development of the research question. That's a lot of scientists ask a lot of planners, well, uh, why aren't you doing this? He said, oh, it's not in the research question. Well, why isn't it? I said, maybe if they come to work with us and we could if we can get our our research questions into into the scientific study, then we won't have to do competing science. 
Um, so uh, that's just a hope and dream. It's a long-term goal and hoping that the people would look at the way, uh, same way we do as scientists uh, and, and, and to be able to take care of our homeland so that uh, our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, they all have what they need to be successful and, and, and to be happy and, and to build on the success that uh, uh, we as tribal members here in Swedish have been able to uh, accomplish over time. It become a slow process, but uh, we gradually build a good, strong foundation. And uh, as time will go on, it should support itself. It should sustain itself and in a common uh, in a common way that goes on that continues to build on what we learned before. Uh, so with that, uh, I think I want to stop here. I don't know what time it is. It's about twelve thirty. So. Uh, I would say good afternoon to each and every one of you. I want to thank you for listening to me. And uh, one thing I need to say sometimes is uh, if I offended anyone, it surely wasn't my intention. But uh, again, that we're still learning how to describe our situations and, 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 uh, and to be able to uh, uh, you know, find willing partners who can come together to be able to uh, protect our home or environment. So with this, I want to thank you. And I will turn it back over to Nancy. Oh, Larry, thank you so much for your words. The, the, your lived experience, your stories, your, um, let's see. I don't think you can see me anymore. Uh, hold on. Yeah. Um, gosh, it is so beautiful to hear your words and they're so compelling and inspiring and beautiful and comprehensive. And um, this did go over a little bit, but everybody um, was so um, excited and interested in your words. Some people had to leave to go to work, but I want to tell you there's this very robust chat that's been going on through your whole talk, and I think um, Chris can figure out how you can have a copy of it, Larry, because so many people are thanking you for, uh, in one way or another, for for your words, and I think you, you'll be interested in reading them all through this hour and and more in this um, series than any others. We have. Um, been watching the chat room and it's so robust. It, it's like this whole um, interactive conversation is going on with people reacting to your words. Uh, it's just, it's really interesting. And, and it gets stronger with every speaker series that we put on. So um, I, I do want to uh, really mention the um, importance of Jamie Donatuto. You mentioned her before, Larry, and she's been such a, a strong partner in your work. So I, I wanna give her um, just lots of credit and recognition right here. Lots of people asked for the 13 Moon curriculum and she's already posted it. And just real interesting conversations have gone on on the side. Um, we had some questions for our speaker, but I'm not sure we have time. Um, Chris, how, how is our time going? So could we have one question or two? I know people have to go, but if people want to stay on, we could have a couple of questions. We still have quite a few people online. So I would say there is interest in uh, some questions being asked and answered. Great. OK, so I'm going to turn it over to Polly then. Um, Polly Walker is the chairperson of the Indigenous Education Institute. She is Cherokee. She is a um, professor, and she's just moved a little while ago from Pennsylvania back to her homeland in New Mexico. And she will field some of the questions that were included in the registrations and also came in from the audience today. So, Polly, I'm going to turn it over to you. Wado, Galieriga. Thank you, Larry. We're very, very grateful for your sharing your wisdom, particularly 
your wisdom about how you've negotiated conflicts to recenter indigenous knowledge and governance, education, and health. And one of, as Nancy mentioned, one of the questions that generated a lot of chat was one I'm gonna to pose to you now. And it's, could we hear more about the 13 Moons program that you've developed, please? And you're muted, Larry. You need to unmute yourself. Thanks. Is, is Jamie still on? I think yes. that she, she, could, she could explain that one better than I can. When Jamie and I, when Jamie and I um, present, we do it together, so we go back and forth. So. I see her. <laughs> I'm here. Thank you, Larry. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Jamie Donatuto. I'm speaking to you from the traditional homelands of the Swinomish Indian Tribal Community, and I've had the pleasure of working with Larry for 22 years. Um, the 13 Moons curriculum, came out of a lot of the long discussions that Larry and I had about uh, creating new opportunities for people to reconnect with a lot of the memories that they had or their ancestors had passed to them uh, about being on the land and harvesting in the appropriate moon cycle. And so the 13 Moons curriculum is an informal curriculum, meaning that we teach it outside of the school system. Uh, we teach to all ages. So everybody's welcome to come. Um, and often there, we ask elders to be there and open and close in a good way and share stories. And each of the moons has at least one activity that revolves around plants and one around animals. And that would be identification and harvesting and learning the name and Lucia seed language and why these plants and animals are, are important in their own right and how they're connected to the Swinomish people. So we've been doing this for a couple of years and it's been going really well. So Larry is certainly one of the lead masterminds on thinking about putting this curriculum together and, and a copy is freely available on the Swinomish website. Um, I put it in the chat earlier, but I know the chat goes quickly. Um, and maybe Nancy, if it could be possible to, to send the link out afterwards, if people are interested, that would be great. And I'm happy to answer more questions if anyone has any. Thank you. I always tell people that uh, some of those long discussions that her and I had uh, were on plane trips coming back from Washington, D.C., a, a five five hour plane trip. And I had a captive audience. She couldn't run. <laughs> uh, but uh, she said that uh, she said, sometimes it took me a couple months to figure out what you really said. And he said, now she's got it down to a week or two. <laughs> uh, I was saying, well, I'm sorry, but that's the way I was taught, you know, and I don't know how to teach any other way. It's you give part of the answer and then you hope that uh, uh, the one that you're talking to was able to, to understand the rest of it. Thank you, Larry. I'm going to turn to another question that addresses some issues around what you talked about, some of the challenges in working collaboratively with non-Indigenous peoples. And that I'll read this question verbatim. Since most current mainstream principles and practices result in inequities, environmental destruction, and suffering, what do you think about sharing common Indigenous principles and practices with the world to integrate into their community planning? to help the shift towards more equitable and environmentally sustainable ways of being, knowing, and doing? What protections would we need to put into place to prevent harm to indigenous peoples, protect indigenous knowledge, yet still support the healing of those who have harmed us for generations for the good of all our relations? Wow. And for Lyra, uh, I would think that you know, for us as, as tribal members that uh, our principle for environmental protection comes from uh, a very necessary point of view of that provides what we need to sustain ourselves, you know, uh, uh, the foods, the medicines, 
and things like this. And you see a lot of your nonprofit organizations that exist. Uh, they're doing it because they're trying to protect the beauty or they're trying to protect something there that may be something that uh, they don't deal with in their everyday life. Uh, either do we right now for uh, a sense of that, but we, we want to get it back. And I was saying that we, we are still hunting gathering people, uh, but with the added incentive there of learning how to deal with today's world. So uh, I think at some point in time, it may take an environmental disaster uh, for the uh, for the residents of the United States to be able to uh, go back and uh, uh, accept that uh, in a good way and figure out how to do it. Uh, we'd love to have partners into that because uh, over the years I worked with archaeologists, I worked with engineers, uh, I worked with you know scientists and really admire the way that if you give them enough information, they can design around a lot of the problems that are, are there. So, uh, and so it, it really is cooperation is the best way. And I say, well, we're taking the approach that uh, we'll build up to it, we'll build up to it. And um, I'm hoping at some point in time, uh, I want to talk to our three tribes that live in the urban area. Uh, you know, they have the real successful casinos that maybe they could put a Coast Salish museum or museum in Seattle in a way that would give us an opportunity to, to be able to share our stories to a, a, a wider audience. And, <clears throat> but it'll take things like that. To, it'll, uh, we have people who love working with us because that uh, they have some of the same values that we do. But for us, uh, the environment protection is part of the stuff that we would depend on every day. There's one other question here um, that relates to your work with those collaborations that have benefited many of us as Indigenous peoples. And the question is, what is your suggestion for archaeologists regarding the ways in which they can improve the current cultural heritage management and preservation efforts towards indigenous culture and traditional cultural properties. Yeah, and that's a, what we used to call a $64,000 question. Uh, <laughs> I spent a lot of years working with archeologists and <clears throat> I found archeologists to be uh, very, uh, uh, very creative in that way. Um, take for instance that uh, <clears throat> all of our village sites here in the Northwest, because that were marine related people, all of our villages and therefore our, our burial sites uh, were on the waterfront. And the waterfront is, you know, the most desirable land that people want for investment in their uh, American dream of a house there, uh, you know, with a, uh, with a water view. Uh, but when we found uh, uh, ancestral remains, the archaeologists initially wanted to send them out to get them carbon dated so we could tell how old they were. And the tribes across the nation basically said, uh, no, that's a, uh, we can't allow that. That's uh, being disrespectful to the remain. Uh, so our job was to be able to uh, gather these remains up and, and then rebury them and hopefully can put them in a safe place. So, uh, but <clears throat> the archaeologists as a society, I guess, or as a profession, a lot of them went back to drawing grounds and found out, well, how can we do this? And <clears throat> what they come upon was to be able to uh, carbon date the material that's found around the human remains. And that would give them, uh, they said, uh, you know, if, if the site was intact and not disturbed, then it would give them a fairly accurate uh, uh, discussion that is there. So that's what I found out myself that uh, 
we as tribal communities and tribal governments, we're still very secretive and private and we don't, uh, we don't share too much of who we are. But at the same time, I realize that if I can't give the archeologists, uh, the engineers, uh, you know, the contractors enough information uh, that if I, if I can give them enough information, they can design around it. And that is uh, the true, uh, one of the true values of, uh, of again, cooperation. Um, as I start talking more and more about our culture and going deeper into it, I, I was surprised that I was saying that, I don't know how long I, I can continue doing this because if I say too much or if I give too much away that the elders around here would, uh, Tell me it's time to shut up and go sit down for a while. <laughs> so, uh, so far they haven't did that, you know. So, but uh, so it, it allowed us to be able to. Uh, uh, we didn't expect our archaeologists have to work on complete trust, you know, especially when they're scientists too, because they deal in uh, facts and and things like that. So. Uh, Again, that's the way that I saw, that's the way that when I start working that way in cultural resources, it finally dawned on me that, well, that's just the way that swimming has always kind of worked. Thank you very much. We might bring the questions to an end now, but thank you again for sharing such powerful examples of how you transform conflict across difference and yet still maintain the integrity of indigenous ways of knowing and being. So thank you. Thank you, Polly and Larry for the questions. I wish we could stay on two more hours and 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 just keep listening. And uh, uh, I just really appreciate everything. Um, I really appreciate the questions that have been sent in and um, Larry, your, your, uh, your answers. Um, it, it, it's, it's so great to have you as our first and opening speaker for this new series on the Pacific Northwest. And your presentation has done so much to begin um, the tone and quality of what we're intending to share in this series. So again, it's been such an honor to host you today. I do wanna say that we've been recording most of the speaker's presentations and they will be available on our Indigenous Education Institute website, which is www.indigenouseducation.org. And the recordings will contain the entire presentation. There's no cost to download them. And many teachers and professors are downloading the recordings and using them in their classrooms as a valuable resources, resource. Um, I do want to extend a very special thank you to our technical support, Christopher Taren of Taren Solutions, Friday Harbor. Each time we host one of these speakers, there is so much work that goes on behind the scenes. The Coyote Factor, which is the Navajo disruptor and bringing of chaos, is always lurking somewhere. And Chris is the one who always comes up with a plan B or C to counter the possible chaos. I also want to thank uh, one of today's primary sponsors, the Madrona Institute, which is a, a San Juan Islands Institute and its director, Ron Z. And Ron is partner with us, partnering with us now and um, his suggestions and support have been invaluable. Also, additional thanks should go to the San Juan Island National Historical Park under the strong leadership, and as you can tell, inspired stewardship of Superintendent Alexis Friedy and park cultural anthropologist, dare I say, and liaison to the tribes, Joe Dolan. Uh, we will send out an email to you all just after this presentation with a very short survey asking your reaction to what you've heard today. Please take the time to answer the questions because your responses are really helpful to us to inform our future program design. We'd also like to hear from you as to your best date and time of the week. We've been doing this at noon Pacific on Thursdays, but that may not no longer be the best time. 
um, we're even considering Friday possibly, you can add your suggestions to your response to the questions. And finally, and most important, we welcome your suggestions for future speakers for this Pacific Northwest series. We already have an exciting lineup in mind, but we know there are more people out there we would love to hear about. So from all of us to all of you, thank you. Wado and Ahiehe to you all for being with us today and have a happy weekend. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Call me, Jamie. Hey, Larry. Yeah. Um, we have a Chris. Are we staying on this one, or are we going to a different?